Hello and welcome back to another video in the Introduction to Windows Forensics series. In this episode, we're going to talk about persistence mechanisms. If you aren't familiar with the term, consider what happens when malware infects a computer system. The malware authors want that malicious code to survive reboots and to continue to execute on the victim machine. In order to achieve this persistence, there are numerous registry keys and other mechanisms and features within Windows that can be utilized. Now, if you've spent any time using Windows over the years, then you are no doubt familiar with some of the most ubiquitous registry keys used for this purpose. Those would be Software, Microsoft, Windows, Current Version, Run, and Software, Microsoft, Windows, Current Version, Run Once. These keys are located within ntuser.dat, which of course is HKEY Current User or HKCU on a live system and also with an HKEY Local Machine, or HKLM, in the same path. Obviously, the former is user-specific, while the latter affects all users on a system. We'll take a quick look at these registry keys and values, as well as a nice article that summarizes this information. Next, we'll look at a program called AutoRuns from SysInternals. AutoRuns will show us the dozens of other places in which we can tell Windows to automatically start a program. Lastly, we'll save the best for last and look at new research that identifies another feature of Windows that can be exploited to achieve persistence, but that will not show up in the current version of Auto Runs or in many other tools that attempt to display this information. So let's get started. Okay, first off, let's fire up RegEdit and take a look at the run and run once keys underneath current user and local machine. First, current user. We'll go to Software, Microsoft, Windows, Current Version, and then we've got Run and Run Once. And you'll notice that on this virtual machine, we have no values underneath either of these two keys. So now let's take a look at Local Machine or HKLM. We'll once again go to Software, Microsoft, Windows, Current Version, and then as you can see here, the run key does indeed have a couple of values. We've got Windows Defender and VMware Tools and run once is empty. So again, this is just a quick look at the most ubiquitous keys that people associate with software starting upon logon on Windows systems. And that's the run and run once keys under current user and local machine. I'll also mention that there is an MSDN Windows Dev Center article covering these particular keys, and I'll include a link to this in the video's description. It provides a little bit of additional information that may be useful for you. Now, this particular web page from the InfoSec Institute is called Common Malware Persistence Mechanisms, and as mentioned here, there are a number of common ways in which an attacker can achieve persistence on a compromised system. By the way, we call these Auto Start Extensibility Points, or ASEPs. You'll notice that this article actually refers to them as Auto Start Extension Points, but technically it's Extensibility. The ones we just looked at would fall into the Modifying Registry Keys group, which you see here. And of course, the first thing listed underneath is Run and Run Once. But as we scroll down, you'll also notice there are plenty of additional keys, such as the boot execute key, the when log on user init key. We have additional startup keys mentioned here and even services. It's actually possible to configure a service such that if the service fails to start, a program can be run. You'll see that in the screenshot here, and there's some additional information about how that works in this particular section. You'll also notice a section on browser helper objects, app init DLLs, association keys. And then I will mention the DLL search order hijacking here in a little bit more detail. So when an executable is launched, Windows will follow a particular set of paths to load the necessary DLLs that are required by that piece of software. It's possible to abuse this methodology by placing a malicious DLL of the same name as the legit DLL in a directory path that will be searched before the legit path. For example, 
This can involve placing the malicious imposter DLL in the same directory in which the application was launched. So that's something to be aware of. Now, of course, we're not going to go into detail on every possible persistence mechanism listed here, not to mention the numerous other ones that exist, but I do want you to familiarize yourself with the things listed here because this article does an excellent job of providing a brief overview of the most common ones that you're likely to encounter in the real world. So in the next section, we're actually going to fire up auto runs from sysinternals and take a look at this pretty awesome tool that will help us determine a lot of this information in an automated fashion. So let's take a look at that next. As of the recording of this video, the current version of auto runs is 13.82, released in February of 2018. This is the page from which you can download auto runs, and of course I'll include a link to this in the video's description. Under the introduction, it states, this utility, which has the most comprehensive knowledge of auto-starting locations of any startup monitor, shows you what programs are configured to run during system boot up or login, and when you start various built-in Windows applications like Internet Explorer, Explorer, and media players. So again, this is not just showing things that start up upon login, but also upon boot up and upon the execution of specific applications. So let's go ahead and fire up auto runs and take a quick look around. When we do, you'll notice a series of tabs across the top, starting with everything, which is currently selected. Everything is indeed everything that the tool was able to find, but if we only want to see a subset of that data, we can simply click the appropriate tab. For example, if I click log on, we'll see that run key, and underneath it, we see Windows Defender and VMware Tools, just like we saw when we manually parsed this with regedit. If I click on Explorer, we'll actually see some context menu handlers relating to the Windows Explorer. In this case, these are 7-zip extensions. If I click on Internet Explorer, we'll see some browser helper objects and other extensions relating to Skype for Business and Microsoft OneNote. Under Scheduled Tasks, you'll astonishingly see scheduled tasks. And of course, scheduled tasks can often be used to execute a particular program on a specific interval or upon logon. Of course, we have numerous services that will start up when the computer starts up. They can run various applications. And the list goes on and on. So again, the interface here is fairly intuitive. Now, what if I want to disable one of these things? Well, that's pretty easy. All we have to do is check the box. Now, when I do, you'll notice I see access denied. Well, that's because we're not running this as administrator. All I have to do is click run as administrator and provided I have the rights to do so, it will relaunch the software under the context of a local administrator. And now I can simply uncheck the box as I've done here, and that will no longer start up. So again, very, very easy to use. And this does provide, in my experience, the most comprehensive view of these types of items from any piece of software I've looked at. But in the next and final section of the video, we're finally going to get to the meat of what I wanted to show, which is new research that exploits a new feature, or I guess you would call it a feature, in Windows that will enable malware authors to create persistence mechanisms that will not show up under auto runs, at least not as of the recording of this video, nor will they show up under any other tool of which I'm aware. So again, in the final section, we'll take a look at that research, and I think you'll find it fairly interesting. Odvar Mo is a Norwegian Windows security expert, and you're looking at his blog, specifically at a post called Persistence Using Global Flags in Image File Execution Options. Mr. Moe has found a technique to execute any binary file after another application is closed and without being detected by auto runs and many other tools that attempt to display ASEP information. This does require administrative rights, as he notes here, and it can also be used with alternate data streams. More on that in a minute. This is all made possible by taking advantage of a utility called Global Flags, which is included within the Windows 10 Software Development Kit. From Microsoft, 
Global Flags provides a simple method of setting certain keys within the system registry, adjusting the kernel settings of the running system, and altering the settings for image files. The utility can be invoked at the command line, or as you see in this screenshot, via a GUI interface. Mr. Mo determined that the Silent Process Exit tab was of particular interest. In this screenshot, you'll see that tab has been selected, and the image has been specified as notepad.exe. Enable Silent Process Exit Monitoring has been checked, Launch Monitor Process has been checked, and then the monitor process has been specified as c colon backslash temp backslash evil.exe. This has the interesting side effect of spawning evil.exe upon closing notepad.exe, as you can see in this Process Explorer screenshot. And as you can see in this screenshot, Auto Runs does not display this information. Mr. Mo actually determined that behind the scenes, there were three registry keys being added that actually resulted in configuring those options underneath that tab. The three registry keys are pasted here to make it a little bit easier to read, but you'll notice that they're all under HKLM Software Microsoft Windows NT current version. The first lives under Image File Execution Options, and the next two are under Silent Process Exit. Adding these registry keys and values has the same effect as configuring it with the GUI-based application. Now, interestingly, as a bonus, he determined that this even works with alternate data streams. And in his example, he's actually created an ADS, or alternate data stream, under the Windows Tasks folder and hidden evil.exe within an ADS there to make it even more difficult to find. And once again, after he closes Notepad, you'll notice that you see tasks colon evil.exe being spawned from the ADS. Now, as well documented as this is, I don't know about you, but I actually like to see these things live in action on a real system. So we'll actually try this for ourselves and see what the results are. So let's take a look. I've mocked up the same example used in Mr. Moe's blog post in this Windows 10 VM. Let's take a look at each of the three registry keys and values that we'll be adding. You'll notice that all three specify notepad.exe, which is our target application, and upon closing that application, we're going to spawn, in this case, c colon backslash temp backslash evil.exe. I have created a temp folder in the root of C, and within it, you'll see evil.exe. As in one of the previous videos, I'm actually using the inetsim default binary, which is basically an application that does nothing but display this dialog box, and upon clicking OK, it exits. That'll be good enough for our test. So let's go ahead and switch over to an administrative command prompt and paste in these three registry keys. And as you can see, we get the operation completed successfully three times. So now, let's close Notepad. And now let's rerun Notepad and close it again. And as soon as we did, you'll notice that indeed evil.exe was executed. Pretty cool. So it worked exactly as described. And now just to verify, let's go ahead and run auto runs. And let's see when this is finished loading if we can find evil.exe. So in the filter, I'll type in evil.exe and nothing, no results. So it is still not detected. And just to make sure the search is working, if I search for VMware, of course, we see a lot of different results, but evil, nothing there. So very, very cool persistence mechanism that is as of yet not detected by auto runs nor by any other tool that I've seen. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. The main thing I was interested in showing is this last section here showing this new research, but it's also good to introduce you to the concept of persistence mechanisms if you were not already familiar with them, as well as to the auto runs application if you weren't familiar with it because it's extremely useful. 
As always, I would like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Please do like, subscribe, and share, and consider supporting this channel on Patreon if you are able. And I will see you in the next video.